So I just want to continue the uh, discussions on the nervous system. I'm going to talk about CNS and PNS diseases. Um, and so just to give you a very quick uh, overview of Hesperos, um, we are hiring at Hesperos. There's lots of job openings if you go to the Hesperos booth. Um, I'm also looking for postdocs over at UCF. So, um, so when you really want to talk, so let's talk about Hes Hesperos basically. We've licensed a bunch of patents from UCF and from Cornell. Mike, Mike and I won the Lush Prize in 2015. We've had a bunch of grants to help develop the technology. The SPI program has been very good to us. We moved into a new facility um, in 14,000 square feet facility in August of 2019. We've got about 38 folks at present. We're a CRO um, because we don't think it's feasible to send these complicated systems out and expect people to get up to speed them on, on them um, very quickly. Um, and also, I'm going to go into the data on this, but we just uh, um, published a paper to describe the research we did with Sanofi um, on enabling an IND that was authorized for a clinical trial. This is the first time that an NPS system was actually used to authorize a clinical trial. It was for efficacy. But really importantly, the way we did it is we took a drug that was in clinical trial for one indication, they took the safety data from that one, and they repurposed the drug for another indication, which was CIDP. Okay? So it opens up a huge number of ways to actually start applying this technology. Um, and so what we really focus on is this idea of clinically relevant functional readout. So many MPS systems focus on cell death as a readout or, or going towards cell death, me measuring L LDH or something else like that. We focus on this idea of looking at clinically relevant functional readouts. You go into a doctor's office, he doesn't immediately stick a needle in your arm to be able to take out fluids, look at biomarkers, right? He looks, how are you walking, how are you talking, he checks your reflexes, he listens to your heart. These are what we call clinically relevant functional readouts, where you can basically um, monitor the electrical activity between neurons and electrodes. You can actually then look at the conduction velocity, these are patterned cardiomyocytes over electrodes. You can actually take um, cardiomyocytes or skeletal muscle put on thin uh, can levers, and then actually when they contract, you can actually measure those deflections. Okay, we can also measure barrier, barrier integrity. We can still look at um, biomarkers where it's necessary. But again, we're trying to do all these uh, measurements without cell death. And all that I'm going to show you from here on out is measurements that were done that are clinically relevant without cell death. So I had this, I, I created this slide literally about 15 years ago when somebody said, well, if you were going to create a CNS model to be able to try to understand learning and memory, what would you do? We said, well, let's try to take hippocampal cells and integrate them with cortical neurons and simulate one and then try to understand how the information is processed. And so, and we made, have now made pretty good progress along those lines in trying to look at long-term potentiation. Okay? Now, the first thing you would have to do, though, is control where your neurons are going. Um, and so this is, we can take surface chemistry and modify the um, surfaces of chips and then be able to get the cells to grow on top of those. This is a fairly old slide, but I love showing it because it's pretty cool. Um, where you basically look at the cell bodies here. This is a neuronal cell body that was plate down. You have a surface pattern that's going here. And what happens is the... Uh, neuron puts out a process that explores its environment. It's kind of a path-finding process. It finds the cell adhesion site, and then you basically get the um, uh, translocation of the cell body after two-way communication, then puts out the neurites to become the axons and the dendrites. And we can use this surface chemistry to self-assemble these circuits we're trying to build to try to understand communication between CNS neurons. Okay? So this is what it kind of looks like here. Um, now these are collections of neurons, they're not single neuronal cell bodies. But again, this becomes five separate experiments on top of a five electrode, a microelectrode array. Um, and we can then measure the action potentials between those systems. Okay? Um, this is, we then took and um, uh, dis differentiated out uh, induced pluripotent stem cells into cortical neurons. Um, Kavina Ator, who's speaking tomorrow at 4.10, uh, will go into this much more in detail. But what we found is actually, if we're trying to do long-term potentiation, long-term potentiation is kind of the carlet for learning and memory, okay? If you're 
about 21 days in culture, you can't do, maintain LTP. Now, and that's because we have a mixture of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, okay? And, but if we then block the inhibitory signals, we can actually induce and maintain long-term potentiation at 21 days, okay, with uh, a picrotoxin. And actually then, if you then go out to about 35 days, those inhibitory neurons turn into excitatory neurons, and we can maintain LTP. And that's the model we use for the experiments we're going to show you. Now, you can basically, we did patch clamp lectophysiology in these systems with A-beta. We're looking at Alzheimer's disease. Um, A-beta ligamers, uh, okay, is one of the initiators of Alzheimer's disease, where we can basically look at the currents, be able to look at the uh, uh, induced currents and then uh, spontaneous currents in the system. You treat it with A-beta ligamers, you shut those down. And then we treat it with A-beta uh, ligamers and a drug, and we basically can turn and basically block the effects of the A-beta. And we can get the same signals with patch clamp. We can actually see those on the microelectrode arrays where we monitor, okay, the... Um, the loss of those signals for long-term potentiation and see with the drug that we can actually restore those. Okay? And just again, looking at that data, you can see here the, the A-beta scrambled. You can maintain long-term potentiation, but the ADA ligamers abolishes that when, in, when you treat it in the systems. The same thing with tau ligamers also. You can maintain LTP with the control and it's abolished. What we've been able to show with that system is, again, one thing is viability is not affected when you hit it with the, with the oligomers. Okay, so we're not killing the cells. Very, very important if we want to try to relate this data to a clinical trial. Um, but then, then treat it with um, denepazil, which is an approved Alzheimer's drug. We can see here with the A-beta, you, you shut it off, and you see it here that we can actually um, protect the neurons with the presence of the A-beta oligomers. You've now extended this to all four approved Alzheimer's drugs, Zinepazil, Zartanib, Menentine, and Rolopram, and be able to show that all of them block the effects of the A-beta uh, ligamers in the system, and now we're extending this to tau, and um, we're getting a really exciting situation with tau, because tau is downstream of A-beta, and we're seeing some drugs that are that actually work with A-beta not working with tau, which suggests why all the Alzheimer's drugs only work for a period of time, okay, and then they stop working, because we're not seeing the same effects with tau ligamers. Okay? Um, we can actually, we've been able to take the mutations at this point, um, the presilin-1, presilin-2, and the uh, ApoE4 mutations, okay, for Alzheimer's, and be able to show that the, um, uh, you see your wild-type control here, Okay, in terms of your live dead assays, we can actually get um, presilin 1s is a more robust mutation. Presilin 2s is very hard to maintain these. In the APO4, it is about uh, midway between the two. And basically, just showing that you get the, um, um, looking at patch clamp like the physiology, you can see the various mutations in terms of the wild type. You can maintain the repetitive firing. Presilin 1s, you can get some repetitive firing. Presilin 2s and ApoE 4s. But what you see here is that in the wild type, you have that 35-day period before you start maintaining the activity, whereas in the presilin ones, it comes up early, okay, but then goes down quickly. Presilin one it kind of spikes up and then comes down. ApoE4 has got most of the activity very early and then gradually goes down with time. So we're now exploring how those different mutations of A-beta is also affected in addition to looking at the oligomers, okay? So that's what we're doing in terms of AD models with these microphysiological systems. We're also working on neuromuscular junction models um, for ALS. Um, in fact, what we're doing is we're taking two chambers that are electrically and chemically isolated from each other, so it means we can be, treat a drug on one side or the other, and we put motor neurons, human motor neurons, we grow axons through that then innervate the myotubes on the other side. You can see here you can get the cantilevers I mentioned earlier, we can grow the myotubes on there. We can also look at motion capture here. Then we grow the axons through the tunnels that then innervate the myotubes on the other side that we create a neuromuscular junction system. Okay? And again, what we can do, we can get signals off of these systems looking at wild type, where these are the electrical pulses, these are the contraction, we can correlate them with each other and showing that for the um, uh, this case, an SOD1 mutation, that we see a failure with time, and then you see it's actually then protected with a um, holistic treatment, okay? 
And one of the things, again, trying to make this functionally relevant, we went to somebody who's running a clinical trial in Boston and said, how can we adapt what we're doing, okay, to what you're actually trying to measure in um, a clinical trial? So well, one of the tests we have is we have somebody do a task with their hands faster and faster. And what happens is they start getting jitters and they also lose grip strength. So well, we can actually reproduce that by stimulating the motor neurons at faster and faster frequencies and then drive it into tetanus. If we see deficit in that, if we def see deficits here, it means we're um, mimicking the jitters that they would see. And if we see loss of tetanus, then it'd be, that's correlated to the loss of grip strength. Okay? This is a very busy slide. This was published um, uh, in uh, Advanced Therapeutics. You can cl clearly see here, though, with the wild type, we get very good correlation. But you see with one SOD1 mutation, you see skipping. You see incomplete tetanus. The other SOD mutation, you don't see any tetanus at all. For the FUS, you see relatively good agreement, but again, loss of tetanus. And then we have a nice control on this. We know it's going through the neuromuscular junction because we can then put the electrodes on the muscle side only and see very good fidelity of the muscle by itself. Okay? And if you then monitor that, you can see that the effect of the um, different mutations as you stimulate faster and faster frequencies. We can then also, again, look at tetanus, and we can measure fatigue index. Again, fatigue index is another measure that's used in a clinical trial. Um, and we can basically see the fatigue index going up with the mutations, okay? Then we treated it with a holistic treatment called the ANA protocol, which actually the field of ALS patients it is, used, is found among themselves where they're treating themselves with this. But this is the first actual scientific study on whether or not the Deanna protocol worked. And basically showing here we can treat that, we can actually restore, okay, some of the frequency dependence, okay, in these systems with the SOD1 mutants and the FUS mutations. And also see, and not so much at 14 days, but definitely at 17 days, we can see a dramatic reduction in the fatigue index when treated. And this actually correlates with what the anecdotal evidence that the patients are reporting through the website for the Deanna protocol, we are actually be able to re reproduce this. And I guess this was published. Um, in um, advanced therapeutics, you can see the reference here. We've also applied this to myasthenius gravis. Myasthenius gravis is, a, is another disease where you get antibodies, in this case, uh, biologics, blocking the acetylcholine receptors, which can actually cause blocking, or you can cause eternalization, or you can actually stimulate the complement cascade. Okay? And again, it causes all kinds of different muscle weaknesses in patients. Okay? We are able to do a dose response curve for the antibody that causes myasthenia gravis. We are able to then monitor an area where we could actually, um, the muscle was not affected, so we could actually look at the neuromuscular junction. If you go too high with the antibody, you start affecting the muscle as well. And be able to show that we can, by monitoring the outside, the receptors on the outside of the cell versus what's internalized, we are able to then show that the, um, reproduce the effects for blocking internalization, and then eventually downregulation in the system, and also so that the, the difference in complement. And this was published um, where we actually be able to show all different three mechanisms of myasthenia gravis. We're working with a rare disease company right now to evaluate their drugs in these systems. Okay? Um, th now, this is the, what I m uh, mentioned to, uh, earlier, which is we did a project. It started off with a company called True North. Okay, uh, which was a rare disease company looking at multifocal neuropathy or CIDP, which are both complement induced diseases where the complement, because of antibody um, production, attacked the notoron VA. Okay, and what you do is you see a, a you remember from uh, Ben's talk, you see this is a conduction ver um, uh, uh, conduction velocity measurement in a human being. And you see what happens is gradually degrades with time. Okay, as the antibodies destroy the nodes or VA, which allows that um, uh, continuation of the conduction velocity down the nerves that go down through your legs and down through your arms. Okay, and what we showed is that in our system, which is a co-culture of swan cells and human swan cells and human motor neurons, that the patient sera from um, CIDP and MMN patients, okay, um, caused the complement deposition, but then their drug blocked it. But again, we wanted to try to make this um, acceptable to the FDA. Um, so we again took our neuromuscular junction system, turned the 90 degrees, and now we have the electrodes running through the tunnels. Okay? 
So we're able to monitor the conduction velocity over the, each electrode to measure the conduction velocity of the system and be able to get a range of conduction velocities of the axons going through. We then did an experiment, which is this is uh, untreated before a treatment with the drug, where we had a, a serum sample from the patient and the isotype control of their molecule, okay, and then treatment with their molecule, and then basically showing that after treatment with the molecule in the control, it didn't affect it with the um, isotype control, the serum knocked out the conduction velocity, and their drug basically um, uh, protected it. Um, and this is now um, what this, this uh, data went into an IND, um, and it was utilized by Sanofi and enabled a phase two, two clinical trial. This is the clinical trial number that's in place, and this is the publication that uh, describes the data that was collected for the IND. All right? And so, I wanted to show is also what we can do is we can actually take those systems and we can integrate it with multi-organ systems where we can look at not only efficacy but off target tox in the same system. And this is actually one um, system we're using to be able to look at opioid overdose recovery and off target toxicity. So uh, we can then integrate these um, single or multi-organ chips, okay, together in fluid extremes. Uh, and I just want to show this data here, which was in collaboration with AstraZeneca, where we were looking at QT interval changes, where cardiac was shown to cause a major QT interval uh, uh, problem. We have the liver here, um, where the uh, terafenidine was turned into fexafenidine. You see that that toxicity was, was lessened. You see conduction velocity wasn't affected at all for the cardiomyocytes. You see it went down. Okay, with the um, heart only, but again, cardiac viability was not affected. Okay, and, but the main point I'm trying to use in this is we can actually then create PKPD models of these systems. Okay, where we can actually then grid up the system, be able to model it, be able to look at the mixing, be able to look at the loss, be able to get the area under the curve. And now it's very important we have this area under the curve. We can actually create a model for a PKPD relationship. Okay. Um, and then we can actually then look at the loss, we can look at the metabolic conversion, look at what was actually um, on the outside of the cardiac cells and what was internalized, be able to get the PK relationships and then the PD relationships. And we're able to use that data in a publication, okay, in Nature Scientific Reports. We're able to then predict guinea pig, dog, and non-human primate data for the PD in these systems. So we can take the data we're generating in vitro create the PKPD models, and use it to predict clinical outcomes, okay? So we can go from concept to design, building the system, testing, and then using the in vitro human data to then predict what is going to happen in a clinical trial. Um, we also been able to do, again, multi-organ systems here. We published with L'Oreal in uh, 2016 and 2019. We've taken out the 28 days. Um, we've also created an innate immune system on a chip, basically where we can um, eh, it's not going to do it. Basically, we have recirculating immune cells here, okay? And this is published in advanced science. Uh, we can also integrate barrier tissues. This is mostly Mike, Michael Schuler's work for, again, putting um, skin is for L'Oreal. Uh, proximal tube for kidney, but only as a tox target, not as a elimination model. Blood-brain barrier and GI tract in the system can also be integrated. Um, and so I'd like to thank all of you for um, listening. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting. And obviously, I'd like to thank my colleagues, many of them who are here today and presenting um, from Hesperos and UCF. And uh, I'll take questions.